Welcome back. You are listening to Nate the Hate on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, and Google Podcast. Be sure to like the video and subscribe. We are trying to achieve 10,000 subscribers before the end of the year. We currently sit at 8,500 subscribers, so we are well within reach. Today's episode is dedicated to Shamsa with a very generous $100 donation. We greatly appreciate your generosity and continued support. Thank you, Shamsa. And if you would like to support the channel, there's the Streamlabs link in our description below where you can make a donation as little as a dollar. Ask us a question. We will answer it at the end of the episode. And if you donate $100 or more, we will dedicate the episode to you. And today's episode is once again dedicated to Shamsa. And joining me today, as always, is my co-host, Modern Vintage Gamer. What's going on, Nate? Great to be here. Great to have you, as always. And we have an exciting topic to dive into today. We recently talked with John Linneman of Digital Foundry about the Xbox Series X's approach to backwards compatibility. And Sony has finally given us details about how they are going to approach backwards compatibility on the PlayStation 5. And they've given us details about their Game Boost mode. And they've also let us know that on launch day this November, there will be over 4,000 PlayStation 4 games compatible on PlayStation 5, but there are a few omissions. That's right. There are 10 PlayStation 4 games that will not be playable on the PlayStation 5. And mostly these games aren't anything of any significance. They include titles like DWVR, Afro Samurai 2, TT Isle of Man Ride on the Edge 2, Just deal with it. Robinson the Journey. We sing Hitman Go Definitive Edition. Shadwin. Joe's Diner. And the only one of really any significant loss is Shadow Complex Remastered. What's curious is Sony didn't really detail why these games are blacklisted from backwards compatibility on PlayStation 5. Shadow Complex Remastered is really the only one that stands out to me as a case of that's that's a shame. It's a really, it's a damn good game. It's a good game. Yeah, absolutely. And if you still have your PlayStation 4 hooked up, you should download it and experience it. It's not a very long game. You can complete it in just a handful of hours, but it's a very good Metroidvania style game. It's also available on Xbox and PC. So play Shadow Complex Remastered and enjoy it because you're not going to be able to play it on PS5. But let's look at some of the quick details of what Sony has detailed about their backwards compatibility today. The select PlayStation 4 games will benefit from the PlayStation 5 console's game boost, which may make PlayStation 4 games run with a higher or smoother frame rate. Some of the functionalities that were available on PlayStation 4 may not be available on PlayStation 5, and some PlayStation 4 games may exhibit errors or unexpected behavior when played on PlayStation 5 consoles. Sony does advise that before you purchase add-ons to play with your PlayStation 4 games on your PS5, Try to boot the game and play your PS4 game on your PS5 first to see if you're happy with the experience. Now, if you have VR, you need to have all those accessories and you can play them on your PS5. And Sony advises to always update your PlayStation 5 console to the latest version of system software. Now, if you have a disc, a PlayStation 4 disc, you may need to download an update. It will then put a, you'll have a game hub for your game homes. This sounds like maybe Sony gave us a little idea about the UI of PlayStation 5. And you will need to keep the disc inserted each time you want to play a game on your PS5 whenever you play that PlayStation 4 game. You obviously can't use PS4 games or PS4 discs on the digital edition for obvious reasons. It doesn't have a disc drive. Now you can transfer games from the PS4 to a PS5 using Wi-Fi data transfer, or you can do it directly from PS5's extended storage drive. And I do assume you can download your PS4 games right to a PlayStation 5 from the PlayStation Store. Now, some PlayStation 4 games will be eligible for PS5 versions. We've seen this with things like Cyberpunk and I believe Activision's detailed a couple of things are the new Mortal Kombat 11. They just talked about that this week where if you have Mortal Kombat, you can upgrade it free on your PlayStation 5 if you... So you kind of already got that. Microsoft has a similar thing with smart delivery. Your PlayStation 4 games are compatible with DualShock 4 on PlayStation 5. You cannot use the DualShock 4 to play PS5 games though. PlayStation Move and the VR aim controller are all supported. 
and peripherals like the arcade sticks, flight sticks, anything that's officially licensed will work on PS5. Now there are some limitations, but it seems like it's mostly related to the controller and the use of the share button or just minor things, maybe like the camera. So nothing too in depth there. Now, I don't know about you, MVG, but my first thought is I'm going to applaud Sony here. I thought come launch day with the PlayStation 5, they are only going to have maybe 100 or so backwards compatibility games available to us, and they were going to do a rollout, something that we saw Microsoft do on the Xbox One when it came to Xbox 360 games. I thought it was going to take them time to build up this library. Instead, they're coming out with basically everything right away, day one. Yeah, no, I I, I applaud them as well. I, I, I agree with you. I didn't feel like that Sony was this far along with, with everything. So, yeah, I mean, they have... They have a pretty good strategy with PlayStation 4 running on PS5. And look, is um, is it going to compete with Microsoft's backward compatibility? For the most part, yes, it will. But there are some kind of glaring omissions. Obviously, the big elephant in the room is no PS3 and no PS2 and no PS1. But look, I think that PlayStation 1 and 2 will come at some point, probably... I don't want to say, you know, within the next 12 months, but I'd, I'd like to think that at some point next year, PS1 and PS2 does get get, get announced. I, I think that's feasible. PS3, I mean, that, that that's its own animal. I, I don't think there's there's really any anything we can do there. But, you know, for the people that want to bring their PS4 library of games forward to the PS5, this is a more than you know, suitable, you know, solution for them. And, you know, I, I'm with you on this one. I do applaud Sony for, uh, you know, taking this, taking this very, very seriously, putting a lot of respect on backward compatibility and giving, giving the fans what they want. I'm very mm-hmm. interested to see how the game boost will work. And hopefully we'll start to see that over the last, or the next couple of weeks when, um, and I'm being very hopeful that we'll, we'll start to see more of the PS5 in you know reviewers hands and things like that more articles will start to show up and we'll really start to get some technical analysis of the system from a software perspective we we've seen that we've seen the hardware side and we've seen the tear down but we haven't really seen much on you know the software side other than just you know game demonstrations and things from from presentations so Hopefully we'll get to we'll get to see more of of backward compatibility from the software side and and the game boost in action. I've got you know my thoughts about what I would like to see, but because it's such a open statement by them saying that game boost you know will uh, affect you know some games, we don't really know what they are. And you know I'm I'm still hopeful that we'll see Bloodborne enhanced in some way, but. You know, knowing my like, it's probably not one of the games that will get a game boost, unfortunately. But uh, but we'll see. Like, uh, other than that, I, I'm I'm very happy with with what they have. And you know, there are some questions, and I know we're gonna we'll go through go through them. But overall, I, I'm satisfied with this. It it does fit in line with what Sony was talking about back in March about you know they were they were aiming to get you know the majority of games running by launch, and you know now we we know that to be true. Yeah, it's Sony is a, is approaching backwards compatibility with a little more respect than I had anticipated considering they were silent on it for so long and Microsoft was out there being very vocal. They were talking about how their backwards compatibility solution was going to enhance that user experience. And every time Sony talked about backwards compatibility, it was very it seemed like they weren't really that committed. And with the information that came out today, they are taking it seriously and they are respecting the PlayStation 4 catalog of software, aside from those 10 games that they really just didn't give us an explanation as to why they're blacklisted from backwards compatibility. And one thing that I did like that Sony detailed today is that when they they put out a Q&A and they put up the question of what is the PlayStation 4 game experience like on PlayStation 5? And they gave a very simple answer. PlayStation 4 titles get even better on PS5. Select PS4 titles will see increased loading speeds on the PlayStation 5 console and will also leverage Game Boost, offering improved or more stable frame rates. Some titles with unlocked frame rate or dynamic resolution up to 4K 
may see higher fidelity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, that's the type of information you want to know about backwards compatibility on these systems. And we also saw Insomniac go to Twitter on the Ghost of Tsushima account, where they said PlayStation 5 owners with Game Boost will see an extra option to allow frame rates up to 60 frames a second. And while the loading speeds on PlayStation 4 are already great, just wait until you see them on PlayStation 5. And that's good. We're going to have those increased loading, th loading speeds, which we saw on Xbox Series X and demonstrations already. Now we're going to see the frame rates get boosted up to 60 frames a second. And even though Sony said it's select, and we know it's going to only be in cases where a game has an uncapped frame rate, that's still that's very encouraging. And the fact that the visual fidelity may be increased in these games that had a dynamic resolution, that's also a really good sign from Sony because they're not quite matching Microsoft one-to-one -one here in backwards compatibility but they're giving us the essentials yeah but i mean game boost is reminds me of the get you know the boost mode on the ps4 pro it it seems like it's taking advantage of the new hardware but it doesn't seem like sony is you know painstakingly going through every single game and applying game specific patches to them in the same way microsoft has been doing with backward compatibility so you know if you do have dynamic res well that that resolution you know scope can now increase much larger than anticipated so we can start to hit those 4k native resolutions and you know by nature of the fact you've got a a much much faster processor in in the playstation 5 you're going to get faster loading speeds. I mean, any game, any game that's running on the PS5 that's a PS4 game will load faster. But caveat, it does also depend on where you install these games, of course. You know, there's also that to consider and we'll come back to that too. But, you know, just by nature of the fact that this system is, you know, so much faster than PS4, Game Boost is just going to apply the, the PS5 specific features and just run with it. So... I think, you know, it, it's very similar to what we've seen to date with Microsoft and backward compatibility, how we've seen faster loading, we've seen enhanced visuals, we've seen faster frame rates, but none of it is, you know, taking any advantage of any underlying API features like, you know, the velocity architecture or, um, you know, um, you know stuff like that right it's all just it's all just kind of raw performance at this point so sony could if they wanted to start adding game specific patches to to really really bring these games you know and make them look so much better but i think boost mode is like a i'll say a a generic kind of blanket solution that they're applying across their games and in many instances yeah if they don't have a locked frame rate and a dynamic resolution or if they do have a dynamic resolution then we'll see in some instances some really significant gain so i guess now that i'm saying that i i, I don't know if bloodborne's going to make it because i know it's it's pretty much you know <laughs> locked and capped so uh, unfortunately i don't know if that's if that's something that we will see but you know a game like ghost of tsushima uh you know that has a dynamic res and then we've already seen them come out today and tweet that it's going to run at you know at 60 frames and the loading speed is going to be a lot faster so any game that has you know the uncapped frame rates the dynamic res i think will definitely see the best bang for its buck as far as you know the boost mode or the the game boost mode and see game boost appeals to me similar to what we saw with the xbox series x because i never upgraded from the original playstation 4. i never saw those benefits of a playstation 4 pro in action yeah. So for me to be able to go right from PS4 to PlayStation 5, put in a game like The Last of Us Part Two or Ghosts, and get that 4K and now a 60 frame rate experience, you know, it's it's a huge leap from what I had been experiencing on the standard PlayStation 4. And there are a lot of us yeah. out there who never upgraded. So this is exactly kind of what you want to see. And it is similar to like the PC route, as we talked about in the prior podcast about the Xbox Series X. It's you're upgrading the hardware, you're going to get these benefits of the increased loading times. Now we're getting better frame rates, we're going to get better resolution in some cases. And, you know, it's, it's exciting to be a gamer to upgrade and see all these benefits because in previous generations, when you had backwards compatibility, you might have gotten some minor 
improvements here and there, but it also depended on how the backwards compatibility was handled. Like in the case of the Wii U, I believe it had Wii hardware right in the system. Yep. So you didn't really get any benefits because it wasn't taking advantage of what the Wii U system itself offered. It was just, you're playing a Wii game. Yep. Or even when you played PS2 on PS3, it was still just a PS2. It wasn't upscaling to HD or anything. It looked, it still looked like a PS2 game. It was mostly just, it was mostly a tool of convenience. Is how backwards compatibility was handled in the past. I mean, you did get some features to like smooth out polygons and stuff, but yeah, you're right. right. You didn't really get any benefit from from those. Yeah, it didn't all of a sudden make Kratos look tons cleaner. It was it was the screen filtering type of thing to smooth things out a little bit. Yeah. And now it really feels like you can look at backwards compatibility and say, we're going to make your favorite games actually better for you. And it's great that Microsoft and Sony are each doing this. Yeah. Both companies had to do this. So I got a question for you and, and just hear me out on this one. So <laughs> Microsoft showed off a very impressive backward compatibility lineup. We saw Digital Foundry cover it. Jeff Grubb, friend of the show, covered it as well. We saw Final Fantasy 15 running at, I don't want to say a Lux 60, but a pretty close to Lux 60 at 4K with the uncapped frame rate. We saw Sekiro running at a almost lock 60 at 4K. Those games are going to take advantage, I believe, right, with uh, of game boost because, you know, by nature of those games, they are they have those modes where you can have an uncapped frame rate and they have uh-huh. dynamic resolution. So in theory, we will see both Sekiro and Final Fantasy 15 running on PS5 with very similar visuals hopefully the same visuals as the Xbox. Now, yes. what do you think is going to... Let me let me rephrase the question. Do you think it's a blow to Microsoft if Sony demonstrates both Sekiro and Final Fantasy XV with Game Boost enabled with a better performing frame rate over the Xbox Series X? Ooh. Um... I guess it would come down to what the difference really is. Like if we're talking like a 60 frame locked on PS5 yeah. and maybe the Xbox Series X occasionally dips to like a 56, mm-hmm. 58. If it's something that's discernible enough to the player to say, I can notice this, it could be a little rough for Microsoft because they've been touting backwards compatibility as such a big feature to the Series X and their product line and if Sony did come out and surpass them, and that means it does complicate their marketing message. And I guess technically it is possible because we know the PS5 does have a faster SSD. It has, I believe, a faster CPU. It does. It's just got it's got more raw power, right? So in theory, <laughs> it should load a little faster and it should run a little faster. But again, you know, there's a lot more factors at play here. And I want to be very clear that I'm, we're just speculating. We have no idea. We don't even know if these games will take advantage of Game Boost, but I'm assuming they are. And I, I think I think Sony could really take the fight back to Microsoft with, with these games that they've been showing off, that Microsoft has been showing off. And I think if, if that's true, then it's going to be very interesting, you know, to see how that goes. Yeah, if I were Sony, I would probably be looking at some of that coverage that Microsoft had put out there of these backwards compatibility games and look at some of the more demanding games and just find those handful of games that maybe didn't hit 60 and stay locked at 60 that may have had a dip here or there and put it in the PlayStation 5 and release a video yeah. and say, on us, we're locked. And you can really shape the marketing message around that if you wanted to. Now... I mean, these systems are so powerful. They're such a huge leap over the PlayStation 4 Pro and the One X that we could be realistically looking at a situation where there is no difference because the games were designed for last gen in mind and this leap to the next generation is so big that these games are going to run without problem. Mm -hmm. But in the case, if there is a game, just for this, you know, the example we're discussing, absolutely, Sony should take the bull by the horns there and say we can handle more demanding games at 60 frames a second. Now, maybe Microsoft can come out and say, but we have the higher resolution. Right. Yeah. It's, you know, it could be that type of game where, where your benefit is. I also have a benefit. So it's a wash. 
Do they have a higher resolution though because they are using their own AI upscaling or is it because of the nature of it's just a dynamic resolution game so it does, you know, hit those 4K True. resolutions? I mean, we, we, we're not questioning Microsoft's backward compatibility, especially when it comes to Xbox One 360 and OG Xbox. Sony mm -hmm. has literally no, no response to those. But if we're talking about last generation, then the the fight between Microsoft and Sony may be a lot closer than we, we we believe because I think Sony has enough here to really compete with Microsoft's back compatibility. Yeah, I think when, we, when we're looking at the current generation of PS4 and Xbox One, it seems like Sony and Microsoft might be standing toe to toe with each other where Microsoft's benefit is really coming in to the original Xbox and Xbox 360, where we've seen videos like Jeff Grubb had his video up where they showed the auto HDR and Banjo Kazooie nuts and bolts. And they described it as amazing. It was hitting that limit of what you want HDR to be rendered at. And that's where Microsoft really seems to be ahead of the game is that they have that auto HDR. Yeah. They've said they want to go back into their you know catalog of older games, legacy titles and increase frame rates from 30 to 60 or 60 to 120. So Microsoft in the grand scheme of things has approached backwards compatibility with a lot more ambition. But if we're just looking at the essential backwards compatibility experience for those only interested about playing PlayStation 4 or Xbox One games on their new platform, it does appear that they're probably standing toe to toe of Game Pass or Game Boost versus Microsoft's own solution. Yeah. and Hey, it's a win for us. It's a win for the gamers and the consumers. Absolutely. That, Absolutely. You... Now I now I can, you know, I, I was a little worried like a week ago because I wasn't sure if I should start buying Xbox One games because I know I can bring them forward because I wasn't really sure about PlayStation, right? So now, you know, I feel very comfortable that I can get either one, whatever the best version of the game is and and know that I can bring that game forward to the next generation. Yeah, and I was that that's one of the big takeaways from today's news is that if you want to pick up Mortal Kombat or you want to pick up really any game that's come out recently or in the last year or over the course of the entire generation, you can buy it cheap now. You know you're going to be able to put it in. You know you're going to get these benefits because we know the blacklist of software. Yeah, And it's so limited that it's not really a case of, oh, I really want to play The Last of Us Remastered on my PlayStation 5, but it's on the list. That's a shame. I mean, the one thing that we do have to kind of look at is Sony did have that very specific line that may raise eyebrows <laughs> of try to boot and play your PS4 games on your PS5 console to see if you are happy with the play experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, That's, it's very. what does that mean? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it means, uh, well, I mean, the way that I, I look at that is testing 4,000 games is a, I mean, think <laughs> about it. How long would it take? How long would it take a team of 100 people to test 4,000 games? I mean, that that is a commitment, right? Um, and let alone, you know, a team that big. It's not. It's not going to. It's not going to be anywhere near that many people. It's probably a team of like 20 people, maybe testing these games. So, I think what they're basically telling us here is while care has been made to test everything we can't guarantee that these games are going to to be playable in that we haven't actually finished playing all these games because we simply don't have enough time to do so and i think that's that's just due to the nature of this particular year being the way it is we know that both the consoles are coming in pretty hot you know we, we still have a lot of questions on the sony camp from you know okay we've seen the hardware now and we've seen some influences, you know, using the PS5, but there's still a lot of questions about the PS5. We haven't seen it boot up. We haven't seen the OS. We, you know, there's things like that. So I just feel like they, they're kind of behind schedule as far as backward compatibility. They haven't tested everything. They have good confidence on the the functionality itself, but I think that's just a, a disclaimer to, to let you know that, hey, we haven't tested everything and some things may be a little glitchy, so just bear with us. 
Yeah, that's... hopefully that's all it is. I mean, it would be a shame <laughs> if you went into, you know, you don't want to go into a game that you were really looking forward to. And I'll use a bigger game just as an example. Like, I'll say Horizon yeah. Zero Dawn, just as an example. And you go into it, and all of a sudden, the game is a glitchy mess, and it's running like the Steam version did, where things aren't rendering correctly. Right. And characters and physics are all over the place. You say, what happened here? And, yeah. you know, if it is a limited amount, and it, it seems like Sony really just viewed this as, we blacklisted the games we know do not work. We whitelisted the rest, but there might be a few here and there that may have a bad player experience. It's up to you if you can handle it or not. Yeah. So, you know, we'll find out as it goes on. In Out of 4,000 games, how many are people really going to be playing in backwards compatible mode? I mean, I'm sure the ones that matter, the ones that people really want to dive back into, it'll be games like, you know, Destiny, Monster Hunter World, Sony's published titles. Those are all likely to function fine. It is interesting. I mean, it's a lot of it is around perception, right? And Mm -hmm. having something, having a feature because you have a feature, right? Like, there's a lot of market research that that discusses, you know, how how many people use backward compatibility, right? And I think that's one of the reasons why Sony didn't really give it as much attention in recent times as they did maybe in the earlier days. Obviously, PS3 technical issues aside, but you know, they've always looked forward, and you got to respect that. I mean, they've they've been very successful with that. So how important is backward compatibility? It's like it's like that feature, right? Like no one wants anything taken away from them. You know, like they, they want that feature, but how many people are actually going to be playing PS4 games on their PS5? I mean, most of us are going to be playing Demon Souls and Ratchet and, you know, all the games <laughs> that come out for it. But with that said, it is nice to to have that feature. And, you know, I, I, I think... Um, Look, I'm I'm gonna, I'm definitely gonna check it out myself. I I, I want to play, you know, if there's enhanced versions of games um, that that run at a better frame rate, then I want to play them. And I think, you know, I said the same thing about the Microsoft Series X demonstration. If there are if there are games out there that do, you know, take advantage of a game boost that do run at a lock sixty, that kind of used to you know bother me enough where I'd stop playing the game then I will give them another go. So having having that is, is, is a cool thing. But going back to the the exhibit errors and unexpected behaviors message, I think the biggest unknown is what does that really mean? You know, does that mean it's, you know, frame rate stutters, glitches, audio issues, you know, flickering, color grading issues? I mean, it, it could really mean anything. And Hopefully that will be something that we don't get to see a lot of. It'll be the outlier or the the exception to the rule, but it will be interesting to see, you know, what what that means. I I do think that they are very much aware that players are going to stumble across these things um, pretty early on. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see we'll see how how widespread it is. Hopefully it's just kept to a minimum though. Yeah, like I kind of wonder if it would be a game. I'll use Batman Arkham Knight as the example because I believe that game was a 30 FPS locked, but it did have a frame rate that dipped quite consistently. Yeah. And now feasibly on the Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5, it should stay at that 30 pretty locked, but the city should render quicker. Yes. We shouldn't have like, you know, the pop-in should be more limited. I wonder if maybe some of the odd glitches or errors could just be the way because now the city might be rendering at a faster clip Mm -hmm. that maybe an enemy when they render they are doing the t-pose yeah yeah like little things like that where you might look and be like what happened there (laughs) and if it's only things like that it's not that big of a concern because there are a lot of games on playstation 4 and even on the xbox one that i hadn't picked up over the course of the generation because there were reports that oh the performance was bad and One game I'll use as an example of because it is notorious for its performance is Rhyme. Oh yeah, it, yeah. Definitely. It was a disaster on the Switch. Even after it got patched, it was had a lot of stuttering, mm-hmm. and it even had the stuttering on the PlayStation Four. And they came out and said the way we stream the data is too much for the CPU and everything to go through, and that's why you get these stutters. Yeah. If you can play Rhyme on the PS Five or Xbox Series X, and all those problems have been alleviated. 
that'd be really cool because it is a nice little game. Yep. I mean, it's not going to be a game people like I have to play Rhyme on my PlayStation 5, but it would be a game I would go back to purely for the technical test. What about Lich Dumb Battle Mage? Remember that one? Yes. That, that one was running at like 15 <laughs> FPS or something. Or like Ark. Yeah, Ark. Yeah, Ark is something that should take advantage of of next Everything. gen. Yeah. <laughs> Because I think that was a dynamic resolution game. The frame rate was atrocious. The resolution sometimes <laughs> was atrocious. Now, if all of a sudden the game looks great and it's running good, it might be time to fight some dinosaurs. Yeah. But like, there's enough examples out there that we could see some of these less known games get big benefits, or they might be the games where the results are going to be very mixed. And I mean, I'm happy Sony's game boost mode is quite similar or if not exactly similar to the game boost mode that we saw on PlayStation 4 Pro and how it handled PS4 games because it's encouraging Sony did adopt that again and it's going to be a little more fleshed out and we're going to get a better user experience for these games. So, you know, I applaud them. And one thing that might be overlooked by some, but it did stand out to me and I have to give Sony applause for this as well, is when they put out the list of games not compatible with just those 10 games, I'm glad I didn't see any of their bigger games on that list. And by that, I mean like The Last of Us Part Two, Yes. Or The Last of Us Remastered. Because a concern of mine was that they were going to limit those games to the next-gen remastered version uh, and uh, not allow you to play the right, older like, version on it. Yep, no, I agree. I My concern was they were going to artificially just kind of block those and mm-hmm. they haven't done that, which is which is fantastic. Yes, because we kind of saw it on the Xbox uh, Xbox One, where some of the trilogies that were getting remastered weren't backwards, didn't have backwards compatibility on the Xbox One. You could, I mean, you could still play the games on your Xbox 360 if you chose to, but whenever these publishers decided to remaster the game, it seems like they conveniently chose not to allow backwards compatibility for the current generation. And I'm glad that we're not seeing that here. Like. I can play Spider-Man on my PlayStation 5. We already knew that. And if I want the remastered version, I can pay for it. It's just, it's smart from the optics point that Sony didn't come out and just say, we're blocking these games. So I'm really happy with that. If you do do remasters of like Ghosts or The Last of Us Part Two or Horizon, you know, you're going to have to really deliver a quality version. Yeah. Because Ghost already looks fantastic on the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 4 Pro. And now we know it's going to get 60 FPS. So you really kind of have to come with some big improvements if you're going to do a remastered version of that. And that's good Mm -hmm. because now a company can actually sit down and say, is it worth us doing this remastered version? Or should we focus maybe on the sequel or making DLC for a game? It's not all about taking away resources to make the remastered version because now you you're getting that best performance, especially if your game's already coded yeah. to get a better FPS or better resolution. So I'm really happy with that. That was a concern of mine. And it wasn't specific to Sony. It also went for Microsoft and it will go for Nintendo moving into the future. You can't give these companies benefit of the doubt that they're going to do something right by you. If they can make money, they will block a game from you and they will re-release it if they can because they know you'll buy it again. Mm-hmm. So thank you for that, Sony. <laughs> and... I mean, right now, of the two companies, Microsoft and Sony, who would you give the edge to overall approach to backwards compatibility? I I still think it's Microsoft. And simply because they have, you know, previous generations covered for us. And, you know, we know that they, they run OG Xbox, Xbox 360, XBLA games, Xbox One, Xbox One X. But I also, you know, want to see what Sony has as far as from a technical standpoint when we start to see these these games being being shown to us. But I also do think, and I, I feel very strongly about this, that I think we will see PS1 and PS2 come at some point. I don't know when it will be, but I, I, I do think it's on the roadmap for PS5. Like it, it would be... It would be something that Sony would be thinking about incorporating and they probably didn't have enough time to get it in for the launch of the PS5, but I just feel like it's something that they can pretty much add without too much, you know, too much work involved to get mm-hmm. those those environments into the PS5. And that, you know, once once that is in place, then all of a sudden we've got a real fight on our hands. Right now it's it's a fight, but 
Microsoft holds the cards here with backward compatibility, no question about it. But I don't think Sony's too far away. And if if what they show us with Game Boost and the PS4, and hopefully these these you know one off glitches isn't a something that kind of just cripples the the experience in many instances, then I think you know they're, they're definitely not far away. So, but to answer your question, Microsoft is is the is the leader at this at this time. Yeah, I would agree with you there. I'd give Microsoft the edge and. The edge is, as you said, it's due to the legacy software of the original Xbox and Xbox 360 and the inclusion of auto HDR in a lot of these backwards compatible games and the idea that they are looking to make games on the original Xbox get frame rate boost, add HDR, and you know they just want that extra step. Both are approaching backwards compatibility with you know nice, nice well thought out planning. It's just Microsoft went a step further because the Xbox One generation was a disaster for them. They had to create an incentive to make the Xbox Series X stand out, and they're using their legacy to do it. And that's exactly what you want to see from a company. They were pushed into a corner, and they said, we have to rethink things. Let's do this. And it seems to be working well for them. Sony, I'm just glad Sony did come out and put in the effort that we had expected of them. Had they come out and... Had they done a rollout, it would have been okay if it meant every game coming out was perfect. Yeah. We didn't have technical glitches or anything like that. I would have been satisfied with that. But to come out 4,000 games, day one, bravo. Yeah, we're going to have those minor inconveniences here and there. But as long as people approach this with realistic frame, you know, realistic expectation, I think Sony's in a really good spot. I mean, we're still looking at a situation where if the game did have a fixed resolution or a locked frame rate on PS4 or PlayStation 4 Pro, it's going to look and run the same on the PlayStation 5. It's just going to have better loading times. It's not going to magically make every game perfect. And that's the same as the Series X. But yeah, Microsoft seems to have the edge right now just simply due to legacy. If Sony comes out with PS1, PlayStation 2, and let's get a little crazy here and say PlayStation Vita and PSP. Yeah. You bring those games over via the digital store. And let's say you did add HDR to those games, or you let them be rendered at 4K and you smooth things out and everything. Then I'm kind of looking at Sony in a different light saying, wow, you guys actually went back through that legacy. You're respecting the Sony brand and the PlayStation brand from day one, and you're giving fans that full experience. We'd have to revisit the conversation. Yeah. But right now... Microsoft is looking at their past and they're saying, let's bring it to, let's bring it to the modern era. Let's make people enjoy it. And let's make these games look like they belong in 2020. Yeah. And that's really encouraging. Absolutely. I guess the, uh, the other um, discussion is about the storage. So you can install (laughs) these games, obviously on the internal SSD, which I think will obviously give you the best loading speeds. We saw again, the demonstrations of the Series X running on the internal SSD, and you could see that the loading speeds were significantly cut down over the Xbox Series X, or sorry, the Xbox One X. The same will apply for the PS5. You can install games on internal storage, of course, and as well as any external storage that you may attach via the USB port. But I think, again, you know, the experience on external will really come down to what type of drive you have. If you've just got a a real cheap, you know, USB 2.0 drive, it's probably not going to load any faster than the PS2 version. Uh, and I'm not really sure what Sony's going to do here. Maybe they will put a, a a cap on how low of a spec SS or external drive you can attach to the PS5. Maybe they just tell you, look, we need, we need something that's USB 3.1 or 3.0 or faster supported so you can't just put in you know your old you know thumb drive from like five years ago (laughs) and expect it to to load you know in in 15 seconds so i i think they're going to do something like that but what are your thoughts about you know loading games from external storage do you think sony's going to regulate you know what drives you can attach to the 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 ps5 because we haven't really heard much about you know their their strategy there at this time I'd imagine they would probably limit it to at least 3.0. If I remember right, I'm sure someone will correct me in the comment section below if I'm wrong. 
I believe the Xbox One, when it came to external, required you to have a 3.0 external hard drive. Mm -hmm. So I envision that both of the companies, when it comes down to external support, are going to make it at least 3.0 because you do want to have some sort of speed. Yeah. To at least, you know, you don't want these games loading forever. You want a decent clip through USB memory distribution. So 3.0, 3.1 is the speed you'd want to target if because i i'm definitely going to use an external drive for legacy software i'm not gonna take up the like i'm not dedicating a large chunk of my ssd which is limited on both of these systems yeah to backwards compatibility support i will do you unless it's a game where i really want to sit there and say this game had atrocious load times let's speed this thing up right in those cases i'll dedicate the ssd but like we have to look at the available ssd just out of the box on PlayStation 5, it's just over 660 gigabytes. That's, I mean, even current gen games, yeah. we're looking at roughly 10 games will fit that. There, there are some big PS4 games that will mm-hmm. eat up a, a huge chunk of that space. I mean, GTA 5 is, is one of them. Obviously, yes. The Last of Us Part 2 is a very big game as well. There are, there are a lot of big mm-hmm. games on the PS4. Yeah, I mean, we'll get into the discussion of storage in a future topic. It's it's a problem for both systems moving forward, and it's unfortunately going to make itself known pretty much on launch day. Yes. <laughs> Especially if you're going to be playing backwards compatibility, because let's just say you pick up Demon Souls day one. That's your only PlayStation 5 game you pick up, but you're as you've expressed in this episode, you might want to revisit Sekiro. Mm-hmm. You might want to revisit Ghosts or The Last of Us Part Two, or you know GTA Final or any Fantasy of those other games. Royal Edition. That's a that's a big yeah. download as well. Final Fantasy Fifteen Royal Edition. Out of the games we just mentioned, you're looking at you probably just filled fifty yep. percent of your PS5 SSD. That's right. And it's what are we? We only said about four or five games. Yeah, and that's right. I mean, the situation is the same as the Series X. It's just, it's just the unfortunate reality. And it's, I, I'm kind of shocked. We're still in a situation where we have to clean out the fridge to yeah. play these games. And is it any shock to you that the games being played backwards compatible? that they cannot be read with the disk drive i don't i don't know the disk drive speed of ps5 and series x versus ps4 and xbox one mm-hmm. is well, it any surprise like are they identical no like should no uh, i mean i know that they, they both use sata drives but i i'm not really sh- up to speed on the actual you know specs of them but yeah i mean uh, mm-hmm. th- there's really no surprise there with me i mean i think you know you, you definitely nailed it in that you know, buy buy an external, a fast external USB three point one drive SSD for <laughs> for anything that's not next gen games that you you want to you know run old gen stuff off. Same applies with the Series X. I mean, yeah, you can install them on your internal SSD for the absolute fastest performance, but you know why would you when you really want that space for for the next gen stuff? You know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess the real benefit would just be you're going to get those loading speeds faster. Yeah. And if, again, I would only do it if the game had really lengthy load times, like something like Final Fantasy 15. Yeah. You don't want to wait those minute and a half, two minute load times. You pop that thing on your SSD because you want to play that in the best way possible. Because if not, you may as well have just kept playing it on your PS4 Pro or, you know, Xbox One X. But if you're like me and you never upgraded, even just playing on the external drive, yeah, I can deal with the load times. I want that performance. You know, I want, I want those visuals. Yeah, absolutely. I want, I want, I want all that. But it is an interesting question because how many external drives are you going to hook up to these things? Like we're talking right now, <laughs> we're going to have an external drive for backwards compatibility. Yeah, we have to buy an SSD. Yep. And for both xbox and yeah, playstation 5 yeah. we have to increase our storage you have to buy an m2 drive to put into the m2 <laughs> slot which will be pci4 it's probably yep. going to be the samsung 9800 i know that we're very close to getting confirmation about what drives are compatible 
Microsoft has their solution as well, which is the Seagate drive. And we just heard the other day that, you know, it's there's more different configurations that are coming, which is good. Yes. I mean, I think that's 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 the way we want it. But yeah, I mean, either way, you, you still oh, are going to be paying a lot of money for any external storage that that you yeah, want to run next generation I mean, on. I mean, we can get an external USB drive for they're not expensive. You can get a terabyte drive for what sixty bucks. Yep. Something like that. And now when you get the SSD for the PS5, we saw Western Digital put out one. If you get the SSD with a heat sink, I believe it's 230. Yep. And that's for one terabyte. They will have a two terabyte one available early next year with a heat sink. I think it's about 450. And we know the pricing of Microsoft's the only one known right now. It's what? It's 220? Two, I think it's 210 for the second. Or 210? Yep. And Microsoft did come out where they said we are doing other configurations where third parties can make them in different sizes. They can do their own pricing. So there will be some range. We can only operate under the ones that we know of right now for the discussion, obviously. And we're still waiting on Sony to give a white list of what drives will be compatible with the PlayStation 5. So don't go out there and buy a three you know, gigabyte per second SSD because you think it's going to work on your PlayStation 5. It's been advised the PS5 needs at least a seven gigabyte per second SSD. Yeah. And those are, and that's why we're looking at $200 plus. So don't buy a cheap one just because you say, oh, it it's a, has a lot of space. It should work. It's not going to work. Yeah. I mean, that would be the worst thing that you go out and buy a Samsung <laughs> 980 and you plug it into yeah. your PS5 and it says this drive is not supported. Right. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, you're pretty much hosed at that point. There's, there's no way around it. And that's where I hope Sony comes out with their whitelist as soon as possible. Yeah. And it's it's interesting because Sony's giving you, as the consumer, a lot of option. Especially once we get the list of whitelists. Let's, let's assume it is quite vast. There's almost no limitation mm -hmm. aside from the speed. And you say, I can buy from all these companies. Great. But you have to wait for that list to happen. You need to wait to see what's compatible. Whereas Microsoft is just kind of like, we made a memory card. Yep. Stick it in the back. Now, Microsoft's case could be, you know, a little more challenging. Maybe the price doesn't come down as fast as where Sony's looking at a off the shelf piece, kind of like Nintendo with micro SD cards. Micro SD drop in price by the minute. Yeah. So hopefully, Sony's solution leads to significant price drops. It's, like, it seems like it will. And. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, SSD storage has has significantly dropped in price over the last five years. I, I expect this to be the same. This is this is still very very new tech, so it's it's going to be priced quite expensive to begin with. But I think a year from now, I, I don't want to say it's going to be half half the price, but it's going to be probably about twenty percent reduced as to what we're going to be paying at launch. I I, I would expect yeah. to see some price cuts. I mean, I could see a one terabyte SSD compatible with PlayStation 5 being 150 by yeah. this time next year. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which at that point, you kind of hit, I'm not going to say it's impulse territory. Right. But it's like, oh, 150. I get another terabyte on top of the 600 I have available in my system. I essentially double up. It's not that bad. Yeah. It's still one of the situations where you might kind of like, you know, twerk your neck to the side saying, oh. It, it really depends, though, right? Because even though you're adding space and you're paying for less storage, you're you're paying for <laughs> for you know a, a terabyte or two terabytes, and you're paying less money than you're paying when the drives first came out. You also have to consider mm -hmm. that as we get into next gen gaming, the size of these games are going to continue to increase. No matter what people say that you know they've come up with ways to right. reduce size, they haven't. Like the, mm -hmm. the the focus of next gen is fast performance, you know, fast loading. Everything else is is a byproduct of that. And I don't think they've sold mm -hmm. for, you know, 100, 150, 200 gigabyte games at all. <laughs> I think it's just going to continue to grow. That's a good point. Every generation, we typically see the advent of a new paradigm for gaming. With 360 and PS3, it was HD. With the PS4 and Xbox One, I would say it's viewing the systems as more of a service yep. in some ways. And now we're looking at it as its speed. Yep. We're looking at the removal of load screens. That's right. And that seems to be the focus of this gen. And unfortunately, it's going to cost us, the consumer, potentially 
significant amount of money. And that's a topic for the future that we will address once we get a whitelist and stuff from Sony. And it's, it's going to be an interesting gen. I'm glad backwards compatibility isn't a concern that we have to have in this generation, though, because we are in the age of diminishing returns. Games still look fantastic. I mean, we have to look at the games Sony put out just this year with Ghost and The Last of Us Part Two. They look phenomenal. No one's going to look at that game and be like, that's ugly. If you do, you have high standards. <laughs> oh, but yeah. like moving into the PS5 and Xbox Series X, the big shift in design is going to be the removal of loads and the basically no pop-in mm -hmm. and just a vast world that you can continually explore without any stutter. And, you know, visual fidelity is rising, but you're going to start noticing that character models aren't that different. And I'll use Spider-Man Remastered just as an example. They changed the face of Peter Parker. People got outraged, whatever. But when you really look at the model closely, you can see the improvements here and there. Mm -hmm. Would you look at it and say that's a gen that's not a generational leap? Right. It's yeah, it looks better. And but the important thing is New York City's seamless. Yeah. That's the that's the change of game design. That's right. And yeah, we gotta buy some hard drives. We've got to buy at least four. Yeah, I think people are gonna be spending <laughs> more than three ninety nine slash four ninety nine for for now, next he, gen. Here's a question for you and everyone listening. Would you have rather paid $600 for these systems and had, we'll say two terabytes SSD by default, or bought them at the prices now of $400, $300 if you're buying an Xbox Series S, or $500 for the PS5 and Xbox Series X, and having one terabyte. In the case of the PS5, Sony opted to use a 800 gigabyte SSD. Would you rather have had a two terabyte one and maybe spent a hundred dollar plus, or have what they're offering you and saved yourself a little money in the, in the you know at the initial yeah. state? It, it's a good question. I, I'm probably leaning towards the way it is now, only because like we we touched on, the price of external storage won't stay constant. It, it should decrease over time. So having that having that flexibility to get cheap storage or maybe there's you know an amazon sale or there's a black friday deal you know on on this stuff in the future it just gives you more flexibility it's like it's like switch memory cards it's like switch sd cards you know if i mm -hmm. see amazon slash the price of a 400 gigabyte one by 25 percent, that's a good deal so i i, I would treat this yep. as, as the same but I, I do get your point that it does feel very very limiting very restrictive with what we're currently going to get but i i think i can work around it as someone that generally plays one game and i'm focusing on one game maybe i have another one you know loaded as like the 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 backup game when i want to take a break i'm not mm -hmm. really going to tax the internal storage as much as maybe some families that have you know kids or two kids or uh, parents with two kids that have one system and they want to put minecraft and all sorts of different games on there that may be an issue you know for, for those people that you know that want to play you know multiple games on the one console but for someone like me i can i can definitely get around it yeah that's a good point i mean maybe we can view storage as the belt yeah. of our uh, gluttony <laughs> of game consumption it's <laughs> it's true I'm careful, like, like five games right now i only have 10 gigabytes left maybe i should finish one of these before i buy a new one <laughs> it reminds me of the days where you would load up mame and put a whole bunch of roms on on your emulator <laughs> you, you'd never play any anything you know but if you if you find your best three or four games you'll play them yep. and enjoy them one at a time but if you just have a collection of everything on a drive you kind of just it's like netflix you, you you're flicking through it but you don't pick anything and then and then you just yeah. you pick something that you've already played before or something you know it's, it's you have something. yeah you almost have too many options that nothing's appealing to you yeah so i'm fine, i'm fine with the with the limited storage I, in fact in some mm -hmm. ways it, it it kind of you know it it conditions me better to be more selective about what i want to play on on the systems that's a good point because as we've seen, software prices are rising, so you're probably going to be a little more selective when it comes to the games you're buying day one. And now you have the storage, so you might be a little more selective of, you know, am I going to pick up 
what game am I going to pick up immediately? And, you know, if I am playing, we'll just use Demon Souls as an example. Yeah. If I am playing Demon Souls, do I really need to pick up the next game? Oh, well, you know, I should finish the game I have, and then I'll pick up that new game. Yeah. I, you know, limit, you don't need a backlog. Yeah. Everyone gets into the backlog flood and you sink into it. And hey, maybe this will, if you're forced to spend 250 bucks on a SSD, you might say, you know what? Let me finish some of those games I've been buying first, and I'll just delete them when I'm done. Yep. But, I mean, space is going to become an issue. It's a topic we will address in the very near future, though. Yeah, I definitely think there's more more conversation there, especially when we get more into what solutions both Microsoft and Sony will have for us from a, an official capacity, you know. Absolutely. And one thing, I, I had just thought of it now, and it's something I wish we would have asked John Linneman on last episode is does the is auto HDR or any of the benefits that the Xbox 360 games are getting if that's increased the file sizes at all? I mean, you would think so because there's an AI uh, component to that, so they're applying mm. some type of HDR to that image. And <laughs> as you know, there are some games that don't have auto HDR because they felt like it it was detracting from the visual quality of the game. So yep. yes, it would have it would have some impact on storage. We don't know what that is, of course, but absolutely, I think there is there is you know uh, a component there that does apply more storage for auto HDR games. That will be something I have to investigate a little deeper before we talk about the storage wars for these consoles in an upcoming episode. <laughs> yep. And let's go into some of the Streamlab questions this week because we do have several. We had a $3 donation from OT Archmage, who writes, Hey there, Nate and MVG. Just wanted to say that you two have the sexiest voices in gaming. And as soon as your intro jingle plays, I know I'm in for a good listen. No question. Just keep up the good work and rock on. Thank you. Yeah, we have sexy voices. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Then we had a dollar donation from Jack E.G. who writes, The Series X is currently not launching with a single physical game, only Xbox One games that support smart delivery. Do you think this will change before launch? And could this be a first for a new generation? I think they mean a single physical yeah. Xbox Series X exclusive game. Right. Or next gen exclusive. And I believe it is a first. Yep. The medium which was supposed to be a launch game is now launching on December the 10th, which isn't too far away. I mean, it still fits in the launch window, but it's not day and date coming mm -hmm. out with the console. So yes, I think this is a first. And I think it's digital, is medium's digital only? Um, I'm, I'm not sure, sure if it has that. a retail presence. Good question. We'll have to check that. But I, yeah, I don't think this is gonna change before launch is we're only a month out from release now. So I don't see any surprise retail game getting announced we then had a dollar donation from the rejects who writes question to you nate and mvg if halo infinite god of war ragnarok or the breath of the wild sequel come out in the same week or on the same day next year for holiday 2021 which would you go with love you guys i would go with breath of the wild too only because i think when i Ooh. when i got that game with the switch on on day one there was just a feeling that came over me that I'd, I'd never experienced for a long time in video games. You know, just that, that feeling of something new and exciting was here. And look, it's Breath of the Wild, right? It's, it's, it's a great game. It's not anything that's like, you know, absolutely mind-blowing or groundbreaking, but there was just something about that game that just made me feel like, wow, this is, this is a great video game. And I, that's something I hadn't said, you know, for a while before that. So I, I, I think Breath of the Wild 2, while it may not give me that same feeling, I still think it's going to be probably the pick of those games. Yeah, this is tough. For me, I wasn't a big fan of God of War on PlayStation 4. Everyone knows that. So God of War Ragnarok really has to do a lot to win me over and get me excited to pick it up like day one. So they have a challenge ahead of them. Halo Infinite, I really like the gameplay demonstration that we had earlier this year i liked the direction that they were going with the gunplay but i still have the questions of just how the game unfolds and 
Breath of the Wild sequel is kind of how you brought up. The first game was such a breath of fresh air. That's not a pun. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so exciting just to explore the world of Hyrule and discover how you can go at you know, certain obstacles and challenges, like just on the plateau. The plateau was one of the best tutorial sequences in a game yeah. I've ever experienced. And when I was talking to my friends, because if you remember early on, you had to climb the mountain. Mm-hmm. Yep. And how you got up that mountain, how you found a heat source, nobody I knew did it the same way. Some of us just ate hot peppers yep. and just was burning up inside until he could get up there. Others did the hot challenge where you actually got a pelt so you could stay warm others said i just lit a torch and i walked up the mountain Mm -hmm. i was like i didn't even know you could use a torch as a heat source like it makes sense in real life but why would a video game do it right my thing with breath of the wild 2 is will it deliver that same wow and magic that the first one did because sequels you always run into that where it's like it's still great you just lost that edge and we don't know anything about Breath of the Wild 2 right now. Yeah. So our trailer, we know Ganondorf died or is sealed. I need to see some gameplay first, but of the three, yeah, Breath of the Wild is probably my answer just because it's Zelda. I love Zelda. I mean, if people looked at my Twitter recently, I just bought a Link to the Past Killian Ang artwork, and it's absolutely gorgeous. So I, I love Zelda, so I'm going to say Breath of the Wild 2, but that's not to diminish Halo Infinite and Sony, you just gotta you gotta convince me with God of War Ragnarok because I didn't like your direction with God of War PS4. Then we had the hundred dollar donation from Shamsa, which this ed- episode is dedicated to. Again, thank you for your generosity and support as always, Shamsa. We then had a five dollar donation from YPCS26. Love the podcast. You and MVG do an amazing job. Look forward to every episode. Is there a reason why you don't actively participate on the Spawn cast? I know most viewers would appreciate getting more of your insightful and informative opinion there. You want to take that uh, one? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do actively participate on the Spawn cast. And yeah, I mean, I'd say in the last month or two, I have perhaps limited my participation on certain topics. And it's only due to if you look at comments made during the live broadcast there are people who are basically they tell me to shut up that i don't know what i'm talking about that my opinion is invalid that i don't play games or i don't know what i'm talking about so you know i i've decided to kind of take a step back and let those people have what they want if we have this show here where has some have gone into the comments and said spawncast is the party Mm -hmm. And they hate with MVG is the adult table. This is where I come for the insightful conversation. This is where I come for the information and walk away with some entertainment and good, you know, inf- info. So it's not that I am consciously saying I'm just not going to address these things on Spawncast. It's just that after a wave and wave of people badgering and telling me to not say things on certain topics, I've just, I've decided to kind of just i'll pick and choose which topics i really want to address on the spawn cast but it's it's not a matter of me not wanting to actively yeah. participate it's just i'm just not going to voice an opinion on every matter yeah I, I, I agree i mean i think the spawn cast is a different show than ours obviously entertainment is is its main purpose obviously going through some stories quite honestly there are some stories there where, where i don't really have much of an opinion on and you know I don't want to specifically talk about what they are, but there are some games that are discussed or there are some topics that are discussed that I really don't don't know much about. So in those situations, it's just best to uh, listen to the other other fine folk on the cast, you know, talk about what they what they know about that particular topic. But, you know, as far as, you know, some topics, usually around the technical side, I usually have, you know, my, my thoughts on, on the show. But you've got to be respectful of the fact that it's it's not... Um, it's not the Nate the Hate show. It's it's the Spawn cast. So we we want to you know keep keep going along with with what John's talking about as well. So yeah, and as MVG brought up, you know it is a big cast on the show. Everyone there is going to have an opinion on a matter. And sometimes when I'm listening to somebody's opinion, I may agree with what they're saying, and I just don't feel the need to reiterate it again on the show. It's already been covered, 
and we can move on to another topic. And sometimes the topic is just something that I don't personally have much interest in and I just have nothing to say. So it's really, we just really go with the flow of how everything's going on a Saturday night. And then we had a $3 donation from Alex, who writes, Hi, Nate and MVG. Great discussions. Love the channel. Ever since I got used to gyro aiming on Switch, I cannot go back to regular stick aiming. First-person shooter is an important genre for me, so I feel like next-gen consoles are not for me. Would like your thoughts. I identify with your plight here. I think gyro aiming on Switch is one of the premier features of the platform, and as I've said in a previous episode, I was very disappointed that Microsoft had not implemented gyro in their Xbox Series X controller because gyro aiming with the Pro Controller and games like Doom, Wolfenstein 2 are exquisite. They're fantastic ways to play the game. And it's odd that the PlayStation 4, the DualShock 4, and I believe the DualSense, they have gyro options. And the fact that publishers and developers do not take advantage of that for first-person shooters, even just as an option, is really disappointing to me. And it's something that I was hoping that this upcoming generation would be embraced more. And it might be because a lot of people associate gyro to waggle yeah and it's just it's not true it's as close as you're going to get to kind of a mouse style control for a first person shooter on a home console and i wouldn't write off the whole next gen simply due to the lack of gyro there is still a chance maybe sony can push for it in some games or if the publisher sees there's demand for it it could happen let's hope it does but i completely understand where you're coming from with that stance. We then had a $10 donation from Robin, who writes, you guys said you felt a storm is coming to the game industry. I feel it too. Dev costs are rising while wages stagnate. I don't think $70 games are the solution. I fear devs will interpret poor sales as a lack of interest instead of cutting costs. Well, I can tell you that devs won't see that ten dollar increase in their in their wages i mean i think that's all going to end up in the publisher's hands so yeah i i i, I agree that that you know the rising cost of games isn't isn't the answer necessarily right and that's the thing the the rise in software costs aren't related to the developer it's the publisher wanting to increase their profits mm -hmm. and and that's the thing there is a storm coming you're going to have developers hopefully especially in america they begin to unionize and they are able to fight for better benefits to better working conditions and if it does if that does lead to a valid 70 dollar or slightly higher game costs to ensure that the developers have a better living wage and better hours and better overall management then we should see it happen. But there's so many, there's a lot of uncertainty in this industry. This industry may have simply, it may be at a breaking point where it has to consolidate in some way. Everything has to eventually shrink. You can only blow up so big before something happens, before you shrink down in size. And it seems like the gaming industry is kind of hitting that. You can look at development studios like Ubisoft, who has. I, what do they employ? Something like 12,000 people? Yeah, worldwide. Yep. It's That's a massive, massive company, 12,000 people. And unfortunately, when you do see some of these layoffs hit, it's simply because they overexpanded at a time of great success. And then once things kind of slowed down, they have to sit say, we have to trim fat. And that leads to the layoffs. Mm -hmm. And it could happen this gen, but I would say... Definitely within the next five years, we're going to see a lot of changing in the game industry, especially as companies look to services to make more money. We see EA do it. Microsoft's doing it. You have like the Disney Plus type streaming services. Those are going to extend to gaming. So something will happen. Hopefully, hopefully it's for the better and not the worse, but we'll find out. Robin then followed up with another $3 donation who wrote, I'll keep this one brief. New Star Fox when? or any word on a Star Fox Zero Deluxe, removing Wii, Wii U gamepad controls could make that game a solid nine out of 10. Wait a minute. The Wii U gamepad controls made that game a solid nine out of 10. 
and I will defend Star Fox Zero controls. I did see till my dying breath. I did see Dylan <laughs> Cuthbert tweeting that he wants to make another Star Fox game recently. Here's hoping that would be because Dylan Cuthbert's last involvement was I think he did Star Fox sixty four three D. Yep, and then he did. Did he do Star Fox Command on the DS? He he did. Yes, he did that so. It'd be great to take helm of a new Star Fox game. I don't think we see Star Fox Zero Deluxe come to Switch. It would require a lot of reworking. And if we look at Nintendo's Deluxe efforts, they're not exactly big fans of reworking a lot of aspects of the game. Because this isn't a Pikmin 3 situation. Star Fox you know, was designed with the Wii U gamepad and the secondary view in mind. And I love that game. I think it was a true sequel to Star Fox 64 in every sense. And I hopefully we see a new Star Fox. I mean, we're probably looking at, let's say Dylan got green light today. Probably wouldn't see it until 2022. <laughs> at maybe, least, at least. Maybe right. early 2023. <laughs> Star Fox Collection, they have 64 and um, the Wii U <laughs> game and maybe the, the GameCube version. Hey, they got the emulators. Uh, might as well put out another collection, right? All right, let, let's explore that for a second. <laughs> we have Star Fox, we have Star Fox Super NES and Star Fox Two on Nintendo Switch Online right now. Yep. Then we have Star Fox sixty four. Yep. We have Star Fox Assault. Mm-hmm. We have Star Fox Adventures. We then have the DS game Star Fox Command, and then we have Star Fox uh, Zero. Of all those, what would you put in the collection? Oh, I'd probably put. Hmm. Oh, I'd probably put sixty four, zero, okay. and okay. assault. Really? Yeah, I think so. You know, I I I agree with that trio because adventures wasn't a Star Fox game. Star Fox yeah. in the title. And that's kind of only. It's, that's kind of it's 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 kind of like Metroid Other M. You know it. While it's yeah. there's nothing wrong with it, it's fine. It kind of sits apart as the odd man out or the odd person out, you know. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's like the Federation Force. <laughs> you just don't count it. Yes. Um. Yeah, it's yeah. I think I would agree with that trio. If you were making a Star Fox collection, it's not disrespect to Adventures. It it was an average Zelda clone. Yeah. But yeah, that's not a bad. I wouldn't mind that one Star Fox anniversary. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Remember Star Fox Nintendo. Nintendo, if you're listening, let's let's green light it. Let's green light it right now. MVG will handle it. <laughs> <laughs> and that will conclude today's episode of Nate the Hate, talking about the PlayStation 5 backwards compatibility, how it compares to Microsoft, and some Star Fox hopes. I'd like to thank MVG for joining me as always. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. And if you enjoyed this episode, give the video a like. If you didn't, give it a dislike. Let us know your thoughts on Sony's backwards compatibility versus Microsoft in the comments section below. And if you'd like to support the channel, we have our Streamlabs link in the description as well. Donate a dollar, ask a question, we will answer it. Donate $100 or more, we will dedicate the episode to you. This episode was once again dedicated to Shamsa. And until next time, continue to embrace the hate. Mm -hmm.